This is the first lesson in a series of lessons in which we're going to be talking about descriptive statistics or summary statistics. In summary statistics, we're looking at a few different ways of summarizing or communicating information about a collection of data as simply as possible. Summary statistics is usually a little bit more approachable than inferential statistics in which we use information about a sample of data to infer or try to figure out information about a much larger population that hasn't actually been measured. That can get a bit more complicated. To start off, we're going to keep things simpler by looking at some basic summary statistics. A data set is basically just a collection of numbers usually measurements of something. On its own, a data set doesn't provide much useful information. Statistics is the field that takes raw data and tries to make sense of it, to show patterns, trends, or other revealing information that can help the random assortment of numbers tell a story. In engineering, design, and manufacturing, measurements are often taken as part of quality control. In order to be sure that parts and products are being manufactured according to their specifications, Periodic tests are conducted to ensure that the products have the correct size, weight, color, flavor, and so on. This raw data is collected and recorded, and statistics are used to communicate these raw measurements into useful information that can be easily understood. One useful form of summary statistics is called the central tendency of a set of data. In other words, this looks at about where the middle of a set of data is. For example, if a teacher gives a test to a class and gets a big list of scores when they're done, it might be useful to find the class average. This tells the teacher how the class performed as a whole. On its own, this average might not say very much, but if it's compared with the average score of another class or the average score on the same test from previous years, then the average could provide useful info for the teacher. The average, or mean, of a set of data is one way of communicating central tendency, but we'll also talk about others such as the median or the mode. Another form of summary statistics that can help make sense of a collection of data is called variation, which is the spread of data around the center. In other words, this looks at not just where the middle of a set of data is, but how the data is spread out. For example, if a test was given to two classes, and both classes received an average score of 80%, this might look like both classes performed equally well. But if we look at the variation of the data, we might find that that isn't true. If students in class A scored between 75% and 85% to get an average of an 80, that means that those students are clustered very closely together, and their knowledge and skills on the topic are about the same level. Class B might have scores ranging from 60% to 100% and still have gotten a class average of an 80. This widespread of data would indicate that some students really don't understand the topic while others understand it very well. By comparing the two classes and understanding the data in this way, the teacher can make informed decisions about how best to teach each class. Some common methods for analyzing variation are the range, standard deviation, and interquartile range of the data set. We'll talk more about variation in the next lesson. Distribution helps us understand even more about how data is spread out within a data set. Graphical tools such as frequency tables, histograms, and other graphs can help us visualize how a collection of data is distributed. We'll take a closer look at distribution in part three of this series. The mean is the most frequently used measure of central tendency. Finding the mean of a data set is the same as finding the average. You can find this formula for calculating the mean in page one of your PLTW formula sheet. It might look a little complicated, but this is something you've probably known how to do for years. The mean value is represented by the Greek letter mu. In the numerator of the fraction, we see the symbol x sub i, which stands for each individual data value in the set. The big backwards-looking e in front of x sub i is the Greek letter sigma, which is the symbol used for a summation. That means that you're going to add together everything after the sigma. In this case, the numerator is telling you to add together each individual data value in your data set. The capital letter N in the denominator is the number of data values in the data set. 
So all this formula is really telling you to do is to add up the value of all your data points and divide that number by the number of data points in the set to find the mean. Let's see an example. Here we have a data set of 11 measurements. Using our formula for finding the mean, first we have to add up all the numbers. That gives us a sum of 243. Next, we divide this number by the number of data values in the set, which is 11, and we find an answer of 22.09 repeating. It's important to know where you should round your answer to. As a general rule, you should avoid rounding until you arrive at your final answer. Rounding off values earlier can cause small errors in the final answer. If your calculator has the ability to store long answers to be reused in later calculations, you should always try to reuse these numbers instead of rounding them off prematurely. When calculating the mean or the standard deviation, you should round your answer to one more decimal place than the original data was given. In this case, the result of the mean calculation is 22.09 with the 09 repeating. Notice that the bar above 09 indicates a repeating decimal. Keep this number saved in your calculator if you'll need it for future calculations, such as the standard deviation, which will be presented in part two of this series. Report the mean to one more decimal place than the original data. Since the original data is reported in whole numbers, report the mean to one decimal place, or 22.1. The mean is the most commonly used measure of central tendency, but it has the disadvantage of being strongly influenced by outliers. Outliers are data points that fall far outside the general population, so in a class that scored between 75% and 85% on a test, a single score of 10% would be enough to bring down the class average significantly. Some measurements of central tendency are able to avoid this. Another measurement of the central tendency of a data set is the mode, which is the most frequently occurring value in the data set. The symbol for mode is capital letter M. In this set of data, the number 21 occurs twice. Every other data value has only one occurrence, therefore 21 is the mode. Some data sets have no mode, and there's no value that occurs more than any other. Other data sets have two modes, in which case two numbers of equal frequency stand out. We call this a bimodal set. If three or more numbers occur with the greatest frequency, we would call this a multimodal set. In these cases, several modes would be reported. In this example, the number 63 occurs twice and is the only measurement that's repeated, so the mode is 63. In this example, both 63 and 59 occur twice, so the mode is reported as 63 and 59 bimodal. In this example, 63, 59, and 48 each occur twice. So the mode is reported as 63, 59, and 48 multimodal. The mode is most useful as a measurement of central tendency when a very large data set is used. In smaller sets of numbers, like the ones shown, the probability of repeated measurements is less, and the likelihood of finding a single mode that truly represents the central tendency of the data is lower. The median of a set of data is the value that occurs in the middle when the numbers have been arranged in numerical order. It's identified by this symbol, which is pronounced X tilde. When finding the median, it helps to first arrange the data in sequential order. Now it's easier to systematically eliminate the highest and lowest values until you arrive at the median or middle value. In an odd numbered data set like the one shown, this is easy because there will be a value in the middle. In this case, the median is 21. If there's an even number of data values, the middle of the data falls between two values. The median is the average of the two values adjacent to the middle point. In this case, the average of 21 and 23 would be 22. In a large enough data set, the median has the advantage of eliminating outliers. So abnormally large or small values would not affect the median as much as they might affect the mean. For this reason, the median is sometimes the most useful measurement of central tendency, 
Although like the mean and the mode, it can be deceptive if the set of data being analyzed is small with very few data points. The quality of measurements like mean, median, and mode is always better with larger data sets. If a set of data was sufficiently large and normally distributed, you should find the mean, median, and mode to be nearly identical. Sometimes they're not identical and the mean is higher or lower than the median. This comparison can provide useful insight to help someone identify outlying data and figure out what is causing it. Spreadsheet programs like Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets have some useful tools built into them for analyzing data, including calculating central tendency. To find out more, check out my video Statistical Data Analysis in Excel. For more on summary statistics, check out my other videos in this series dealing with variation and distribution. Thanks for watching.